I'm going to so pinch hitting here for, uh, for Bill Price uh, from uh, WCPO. Typically, uh, uh, Bill is the one as the health reporter for Channel 9 who introduces our speaker. Uh, but uh, that duty has fallen to me today, and, and I am pleased to, to welcome to Cincinnati and introduce uh, Dr. Melvin Morris, who is a, a graduate of George Washington University School of Medicine and a recipient of the uh, National Service Research Award. He's a recognized authority in the field of near-death studies. He's a professor of uh, pediatrics at the University of Washington and also maintains a busy private practice uh, in, in Washington. He lives there with his wife and four children. He's written three books and numerous scholarly articles on near-death experiences. When he stands up here, you may recognize his face from the numerous television programs that he's been on over the years, Oprah Winfrey, among others, and uh, I think you'll enjoy his presentation today. Please uh, give us a nice night welcome to uh, Melvin Moore. New proof of life after death. University professor reveals from people who have been to a world beyond the grave and returned. Um, I am the university professor referred to uh, in this uh, prestigious journal, and uh, I have been in many similar such uh, prestigious journals. Um, AMA Medical Report documents the proof of life after death. Um, in fact, I'm not going to be discussing life after death today. I, I can't tell you how pleased I am to have been invited to speak on behalf of Spiritual Wellness and the Health and Wellness Center. Because the real, to me, the real interest that I have in near-death experiences has nothing to do with life after death. It has to do with life itself. The theme song of the International Hospice Association is, teach me to die and I will teach you how to live. And that's from a, a young boy uh, who wrote uh, a poem uh, uh, with those words in them. And I'm going to share with you today what I've learned about dying from talking with children who have come to the edge of death and been resuscitated by medical technology. They haven't died and returned. Um, there's a Zen Buddhist joke. And uh, the Zen disciple says to the master, Oh, tell me, oh great master, of what happens after death, of the mysteries of the world beyond. And the Zen Buddhist master says, <laughs> why are you asking me? <laughs> and the disciples puzzled, but, but you're the great master. You know the secrets of life and death. And the master said, that's quite true. But I am not a, a dead Zen Buddhist master. So I have never studied anyone who has died and returned to life. So I know nothing of that. Furthermore, I, I want you all to know a little bit about today's talk and myself because I want you all to get the most out of my talk today. I'm a full-time practicing pediatrician in private practice in Seattle, Washington. Less than 1% of my time is spent on near-death studies or even thinking about near-death studies. This is, in fact, the first time I've ever lectured to a group such as this. Virtually all of my talks are to the professional medical community. I speak at Stanford Children's or at, uh, you know, the different to groups of medics or um, uh, such as that. I, I don't uh, particularly uh, speak to the general public. My interest in this area is entirely scientific. Furthermore, I've never had a child who has died. 
I lost a child somewhere in the introduction simply because I have five children. <laughs> I've never had a child die. Nor has tragedy ever touched my life. My father died about 10 years ago, and he did come to me when he died to tell me of that. But I thought that was just a crazy dream. And, and quite frankly, most of, it, most of my mind thinks it still is just a crazy dream. So I really have no credentials to speak to you all. I have no spiritual beliefs. Uh, somebody that uh, I signed one of my, my books for asked me if I would speak about God a little bit, so I am going to talk to you uh, later on about one uh, spiritual experience I have had. But I, I, I'm not religious. I have no spiritual philosophy. Um, that's it. And so, <laughs> if, at, if at this point you guys are wondering, well, why did they even invite him? <laughs> I am too. I am too. Nevertheless, um, I did spend a lot of time preparing a talk for you all today because there are spiritual implications uh, to my area of research. But they have to do with living. And I'm going to share with you what my research has meant to me, what I have learned from talking to children who have nearly died. I plan to talk for two hours. And uh, after that, um, I'm certainly uh, w glad to stay as long as uh, necessary for questions. Um, but I did plan for the, uh, my talk to be two uh, hours. Why am I interested in this area at all? Uh, I was, for many years, a critical care physician at Seattle Children's Hospital. I worked for an outlift, uh, for an uh, outfit known as Airlift Northwest. And we transport critically ill children uh, from a uh, four-state area around the Seattle area uh, to uh, Children's Hospital. And about uh, 1982, uh, we picked up a young girl uh, named Crystal uh, in Pocatello, Idaho. And she uh, had been found uh, drowned in a community swimming pool. And uh, she uh, has, uh, was documented as having no heartbeat for 19 min minutes. Uh, and physicians in the audience, of course, know that that's not a miraculous resuscitation. Um, uh, all critical care physicians know that if they're not warm and dead, you're not dead. And uh, this girl uh, was ultimately resuscitated. Uh, when I saw her for the first time, uh, her pupils were fixed and dilated, uh, which we take as a sign of profound coma uh, and as a sign of impending irreversible brain damage. And yet she was uh, completely uh, recovered two weeks later. Um, I also was working at the time as a resident uh, in that uh, local community and uh, in a private physician's office. And just by coincidence, um, she happened to be a patient at that office. And I just walked into the room uh, to see her for follow-up. And she turned to her mother and she said, look, there's the doctor that stuck a tube in my nose. I thought that was odd because she had only seen me when she was profoundly comatose. She said, oh yeah, I remember the tall, thin doctor said to you, thank God you're here. Uh, referring to Bill Longhurst, uh, the community physician uh, who was uh, at the scene. She then said, I saw you take me and put me in a machine that looked like a donut. And she gave a detailed description of her own resuscitation. She then described the spiritual experience she had uh, in which she perceived herself to be out of her physical body, went down a tunnel accompanied by a spirit guide to a place she thought was heaven, um, and felt she was even given a choice to return uh, to uh, her body. The spiritual aspects of her story were not interesting to me. She came from a deeply religious Mormon family. They prayed continually at her bedside. I assumed the spiritual aspects of her story were simply her mind struggling to come to grips with nearly dying, and that it was some sort of mingling of her religious beliefs with uh, um, uh, her uh, parents' uh, religious uh, preoccupations. It was interesting to me that the mother said, 
I said to the mother, well, tell me how you explain death to her. The mother said, well, we always told her that when you die, it's like going to the edge of a lake, and then your soul gets in a boat and sails across the ocean. And she also said that we teach our children that, um, that to be alive is like uh, being a glove and that the spirit is inside the glove. So if you look at the glove, you know, you see it moving around, and then when the spirit leaves, the glove seemingly is unchanged. It just doesn't have its animating uh, force in it anymore. So again, that intrigued me, uh, as her experience had the gloves in them and didn't have the uh, metaphor of a boat uh, in it, uh, but was rather this tunnel experience. No, I was mostly interested that she had any memory at all of the time she was critically ill. It was fascinating to me. The gods that I worship, Plum and Posner, who wrote the diagnosis of, co of coma and stupor, write, coma wipes clean the slate of consciousness. And yet here is a child who says that she was at the point of death, and yet she was awake, conscious, and aware of her surroundings. And I was quite interested in that. Now, I think it's only fair to alert you guys where I'm going with my talk. I've already told you it's not life after death. I've told you my interest is primarily in the neurophysiology of consciousness. I've studied this area for nearly 15 years. I'm familiar and have been uh, closely associated uh, with every major name in consciousness research. So I'm going to tell you all today the most amazing story I know. I've been interviewed by Hugh Downs, all those guys, women too. And they always say to me, tell me your most amazing story. So I assume an audience like this would like to hear too. What is the smoking gun of near-death research? Someone once came to me and asked me that. Tell me the story that proves these experiences are real. I'm going to tell you a story then. All right, here it is. The most amazing story I know. The one story I would like everyone here to understand by the end of this lecture. The story I would like everyone to take home. And this is the story of a baseball pitcher named Randy Johnson. Are people here baseball fans? Randy Johnson's a pitcher for the Seattle Mariners. I'm a big baseball fan. And I uh, heard uh, Randy Johnson on the radio describe this experience. Randy Johnson's dad died before the 1994 baseball season. He was devastated by his dad's death. And he dedicated the 1994 season to the memory of his dad. And that was his best season ever in professional baseball. That was the breakthrough year for Randy Johnson. That was the year that he stepped it up to a superstar pitcher. <laughs> that wasn't a very good story, was it? <laughs> what? No supernatural elements to that story? What? Randy Johnson didn't say that he, you know, that an angel appeared uh, at a crucial time in a game and told him to throw a fastball instead of a slider. Randy Johnson didn't say he saw angels in the outfield blowing balls into the field. No, he didn't say any of that. He said that the memory of his dad inspired him to be a better human being. And he was able to harness the grief that he felt to step up his life to a higher notch.